Hi again. As promised, I'm going to help you break down the primary material for writing paper two. And the biggest material that you're going to need to be familiar with is this book right here, the, uh, the uh, Paul Johnson text, Sam Patch, The Famous Jumper. Now, first things first, whether you bought an actual hard copy of the book like I did, or you were simply following along on the material that I put up on eCampus, it's the exact same thing. Um, it's actually just a photograph of the um, of the book itself. So the page numbers are the same, is what I'm trying to tell you. You know that the centrality of the question that I've asked you is what's happening in America in the early Republic period. And one of the simplest answers to that is industrialization. The, the American Industrial Revolution has changed American life and what it means to be an American. Now, keep in mind, guys, uh, one of the things that I think is essential to understanding American history is this issue of freedom, the issue that America is an exception to other great societies and great civilizations throughout world history, Britain, the Roman Empire, the ancient Chinese. America was the exception in the sense that you could be born into humble origins, humble beginnings, and you could rise as high as your talents would take you, and you could literally become the next Abraham Lincoln. Occupy the highest office in the land. To a lot of Americans that, live, that were living through the early 19th century, industry posed a direct problem to that. It posed a direct obstacle. I mean, think about it. How much does a vote really mean if you don't know where your next meal is coming from? Now, that's an abstract concept, but it's a concept that Sam Patch, the individual, absolutely intersects with. So the first thing that I want us to do is figure out who the heck Sam Patch actually was. Now, you don't have to go too far for this. On the preface, the first page, first textual page of it, it's Roman numeral, um, I guess that would be Roman numeral 9. Uh, the first sentence of the book says, this is the story of Sam Patch, a factory hand who in the 1820s became America's first professional daredevil. Patch jumped from high places beside waterfalls. Journalists wrote about him. Uh, crowds came to see him. Boys imagined being him. And he became a famous man. Sam Patch was a mill boy who became a celebrity. So who is Sam Patch? Well, he's kind of a modern-day American dream, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, a, a fantasy almost. He's a modern, well, he's a 19th century of the American Idol. Uh, think about that for a second in terms of what he meant to popular culture. But I want to take you back to that first sentence. He was a mill hand. He was a factory worker. Okay? So right there is your first connection that the story of this book is about a factory worker. Now, if you read chapters 9 and 10, and you pay close attention to the videos, particularly lesson 15, or actually 14, 15, and 16, I think that you'll come to the conclusion that although industrialization had a democratic with a small d spirit to it, it had an unintended consequence of creating massive gaps in between the wealth for rich people and working class people. To give you an example of that, and again, to connect it to what you're reading, open up to chapter 1, which is entitled Pawtucket. That would be on page 3 of your textbook. Um, if you flip the page over, it starts out on, uh, on, on, on page 3, but it bleeds over into page 4. Read that uh, second paragraph. It starts out, post-revolutionary America was an overwhelmingly rural republic and proponents of domestic manufacturers insisted factories would threaten neither agriculture nor, in, nor the independence of farmers. What he's saying there is that we could essentially have our cake and eat it too. I mean, people like Thomas Jefferson, if you recall from the last unit, Jefferson said, the second that you open America's doors to industrialization is the second that America becomes the next England, where you have you know, these dark, satanic-looking factories where people go in and get chewed up. They, they work dangerous jobs, and they work them for very little pay. And in short, it directly threatens American freedom. The institution is American freedom. Let's push the envelope a little bit further. Flip the page over to page 4. 
And about four lines from the bottom, there's a sentence that begins, Thus Americans. Find that. Thus Americans, said the promoters, could enjoy domestic manufactured goods without the threats to agriculture and without the European messiness of industrial cities or an industrial working class. There would be, they promised, no Manchesters in America. In other words, once again, we can have our cake and eat it too. We get all the benefits of industrialization, a higher standard of living, lower prices, um, but we don't have any of the costs that are associated with it. You don't have any of the ugliness that comes along with industrialization. Once we begin to see the process of industrialization unfolding, you find out pretty quickly that you can't have your cake and eat it too. Um, again, I'll point you to Sam Patch. Uh, check out the third, it's the third full paragraph there on page four. As the new family struggled into Pawtucket, Pawtucket was an industrial boom town at the time. As the new family struggled into Pawtucket, Slater and other mill owners began referring to the workers as poor children, that description of people, those who are dependent on daily labor for support. So almost immediately after we see industrialization come to the United States, the people that promised us we wouldn't have to put up with a lack of freedom or a threat to freedom are acknowledging that industrialization is doing exactly that, threatening our freedom. One last example before we move on to another topic, and this will engage exactly the, the Patch family. As you'll come to find out if you read that chapter carefully, Mayo Greenleaf Patch, Sam Patch's father, was not exactly a great guy. Um, he drank too much, he spent too much, and in short, he basically blew the, Sam, the family's savings. So look on page 18, and there's a paragraph toward the bottom of that page that begins, With that, the Patches exhausted the family connections. Find that. With that, the Patches exhausted the family connections on which they had subsisted since their marriage. The long stay in North Reading and the moves to Danvers and Marblehead had been determined by the availability of relatives and their resources. In 1807, the Patches moved to the mill village of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, nearly 100 miles south of their neighbors in which the Patches and the McIntyres had always lived. The move was the climactic moment in their history. It marked their passage out of the family economy, farm labor, and into the labor market, as Thomas Jefferson would put it. It moved them into a state of dependency, dependency on a job for, from the factory owner. The next paragraph. New England families did not move to Pawtucket Mills unless something bad had happened, usually to the man of the house. And that's exactly the case, as you'll find out if you read a little bit further. That's exactly what happened to Greenleaf Patch. Uh, because he had exhausted the family's resources, there was nothing left for his family to do but to enter into the factory labor. And when that happened, not only did they make substantially less than what they had as farmers, but they were continuously dependent on the factory owners for a job. So if the factory owner came to them and said, look, I'm going to pay you a dollar less per hour than I did yesterday, what recourse do the family really have? They're essentially tied to that job. They needed the job in order to survive. Now, even though that there was a great deal of dependency involved in factory labor, I don't want you to get the idea that factory workers, including Sam Patch himself, was not proud. Flip the page to 33. There's a picture on 33. You can't miss it. Once you get there, look for that first full paragraph. It said, before 1820, most spinners. Find that. Before 1820, most spinners in New England mills were immigrants from the factory towns of Lancashire in England. They were veterans who knew that their skills were essential and they commanded respect. Slater, factory owner, and the other proprietors may have owned the spinning mules, but the spinners were semi-independent subcontractors. In other words, there was a lot of pride, there was a lot of honor, and there was a lot of dignity in being a spinner, the job that Sam Patch does inside this factory. It wasn't just some down-on-your-luck loser that just took orders all day long. It was somebody that you actually had to have the skill set to, to make it in that world. 
I hope that this segment has provided you with two things. One, you have a much better understanding of who Sam Patch was and you know what he did in American life. But secondly, I, I hope that you can understand that industrialization was not all fun and games. Um, it did modernize America, but there were social consequences with that. The emergence of a working class, the emergence of great big cities that were not exactly the most pleasant places to live, uh, the emergence of class conflict. Um, the interests of people like Sam Patch were directly opposed to the people that own the factories and the mills. In the second segment, we're going to talk about two different topics. What factory owners are doing to maximize their profits and how their workers, people like Sam Patch, are responding to it.